Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, January 16th, 2019. It is another one of those super slow news days that we are coming to expect as we look out across the United States that's kind of missing a lot of its science community as they either try to figure out how to deal with the government shutdown or they sit at home twiddling their thumbs because of the government shutdown, which is turning out to kind of mean a science shutdown. We here at The Daily Space are here because of you. We are here because your donations allowed CosmoQuest to keep going. And I'm so very grateful that we are here to keep, well, keep crunching the numbers, keep reporting the science, and keep talking about all this stuff we love. So thank you. And thank China for today's news, because, well, it turns out China is behind well, it's not behind the moon. Well, it is behind the moon. More on this. So currently on the other side of the moon, so literally behind the moon from us, we have China growing cotton. Not sure quite why they chose cotton of all the different things to grow, but they're growing cotton. This is an image where you can just kind of make out there's a leaf here, there's a leaf here. And as you squint closely at these leaves, this is cotton growing on the moon in a closed containment vessel. So it's, it's not growing in lunar soil, it's not exposed to vacuum and radiation from the sun, but it's cotton growing in the low gravity of the moon. It's kind of exciting. So yeah, China is literally behind the moon right now, but, but they're not behind the lunar eclipse. This weekend, Martin Luther King weekend here in the United States, we are going to be seeing the moon going dark. Thank you, goose and geese. Thank you very much for the follow. So this weekend, uh, late Sunday night going into Monday morning, we are going to experience everywhere in the Americas. Um, this is like precisely lined up to get all the Americas. I'm really kind of amused with how beautifully this eclipse map lines up. Uh, we're gonna see the moon dip into the shadow of the earth. Most of the time we have our Earth, we have our, in this case, Tasmanian moon, and as the moon orbits, it dips, it doesn't flip over. I need to do this because my hand, it's either behind and above or below and in front of the Earth as it orbits, but sometimes it instead dips exactly behind and passes exactly in front. And in these moments, we can get a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, depending on which side of the Earth the moon is on, and they always come in pairs. So a couple weeks ago, we had a partial solar eclipse visible to a few people here on the Earth. And now we're about to get that lunar eclipse that is available to everyone, everyone in the Americas, at least. So if you haven't yet made your holiday weekend plans, people in the United States, look at the weather forecast and figure out how to get yourself somewhere with a clear sky if you want to find out, well, what color the moon is going to be this time. The thing about lunar eclipses is the color they appear at the moment when they're in the deepest shadow of the Earth is a direct refraction of the sun's light as it bends through the atmosphere and the colors that are allowed to pass through the atmosphere and scatter off of the moon reflect off of the moon they are always slightly different if our atmosphere is filled with soot or pollution or well all the stuff that comes out of volcanoes will end up with a blood red mood, moon as all the shorter wavelengths of light, all the blues are scattered out in every direction except through the atmosphere. Well, some of them are. They're scattered in, scattered in completely random directions. If instead the, the 
atmosphere is completely clear, if we're having one of those magical moments of great atmosphere, we'll instead end up with a fabulously gray moon. So we'll find out exactly how our atmosphere is doing this Sunday night going into Monday. Now, I know a lot of you are places where this just isn't going to be the kind of thing you're able to see. I, for one, am going to be in Boston at the Eurasia Science Fiction and Fantasy Convention, and um, the weather does not look promising. I originally had grand ideas to march people outside to look up in all of their various cosplay, but if it's snowing, we're not going to see this. Now, my good friend and co-host of Astronomy Cast, Fraser Kane, is working with our friends over at Oceanside Photo and Telescope, and they are going to be broadcasting this over the internet, so there is going to be a way for you to watch the eclipse in progress if you can't get out and see it with your own eyes. Now, these aren't incredibly rare. We get lunar eclipses a couple of times a year. They aren't always visible to everyone on the Earth, as indeed, well, if you're in the wrong part of Russia or China or Japan, you're not really going to see this one at all. Um, Africa, you get it in bits and pieces and dribs and drabs. Um, every eclipse picks its own part of the Earth to scorn. So if you miss this one, just wait a little bit. You'll see it later. Not this one, but you'll see another one later. Now, in one final story for today, this time brought to us again from China, we have a story of black hole observations. In this case, a dedicated, and here I'm going to read this off because otherwise I'm going to screw up the pronunciation. I need to be looking at it. A dedicated gamma ray burst polar remedy polarimetry experiment called Polar was mounted on top of China's Tiangong-2 space lab and was launched back in September of 2016. This particular instrument had the ability to measure gamma ray radiation that was emitted in the moment that black holes formed, either through the merger of neutron stars or through the collapse and supernova explosion of truly massive stars. It was theorized that the light that came out during these cataclysmic events had the potential to be lined up, that the waves would be traveling through space somewhat coherently. It's not coherent light, that's a strong word to be using, I'm not using that word, but that the light would be moving along in a polarized fashion with the light waves aligned. Now, this is the kind of thing that this particular instrument was designed to look at. And when it looked at the formation of numerous black holes through the gamma ray emissions, it could individually detect each gamma ray photon. And depending on how that photon was aligned, how it was polarized, different things would happen within the instrument, allowing the instrument to figure out, are the gamma rays that coming in consistently polarized in the same way? What they found was consistent was a matter of how short a period of time that you looked. Over the smallest of time slices, they were able to see the gamma rays were polarized together, were polarized in a coherent manner. But over time, chaos emerged. So this is a fascinating way of seeing that this is a system that is evolving, is changing, but is working to emit light in a polarized manner over time. So we need to modify our theories, but it's clear we're going down the right track. Science is incremental. We come up with ideas. We think we can understand things. And then we test our understanding against the actual universe using instruments like this. In the universe, it tells us if we're right or not. And sometimes we're kind of right, but not completely right. This is one of those times. And thanks to the more data that this instrument got us, we now know we need to evolve our theories, but keep going down this path. So it was kind of a slow news day. This is what I've got. We have cotton behind the moon. 
we have a spacecraft on, we have an instrument on a Chinese space lab that is describing black holes to us, and we have a tail of a lunar eclipse. So China, China, not China. Um, the science goes on. And luckily, we have an entire world of scientists working to advance our understanding of the universe. So I'm now here to answer your questions. If you can at me in the chat, it will make it easier for me to find all of your questions and answer them quickly while you type them in. Um, well, just a friendly reminder. CosmoQuest is a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. Thank you, Tom Van Scooter, for the subscription. Thank you so much. This is six months in a row. Um, in terms of Twitch babies, you are two trimesters along, which always confused me because it turns out pregnancy is actually 10 months, but that's a different topic for a different broadcaster. Anyways, um, so we are a production. Thank you, Ms. Kitts, for the follow. We are a production of the Planetary Science Institute working with Youngstown State, U State University. We are here because of you. Give us a follow, follows are free, and find out whenever we go live. We give you the daily space, most Mondays through Fridays. Uh, we are your fast-paced introduction to all that is new in astronomy and space science coming out at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. That is 6 p.m. London time. And thank you, Kmore, for the bits. Can we just light up the chat for everything amazing that's going on? Now, um, we are also sustained by you. Every subscription really makes a difference, and every bit really counts. Thank you for making it possible for us to do, it, do this, and we're going to do everything we can to make you proud, bringing you launches, landings, press coverage, and all the news that we can. We are going to be bringing back our CosmoQuest office hours as soon as we're done bringing back the website, which is taking us far longer to edit than anticipated. I'm hoping to make major progress today. So I'm here for your questions. And uh, I already saw some in there, so let me scroll up and see what I can find. Uh, Hanny is asking, Thank you, Veronica Cure, for the bits. I love that we can always count on you out there to be there for five bits. And if I don't see those, I'm going to worry about you. Um, we don't demand your bits. We do demand your presence. Anyways, Hanny Zvorverp um, asks, if I was on the moon, would the Earth look like a ring of light? Um, do you mean during the eclipse? Yes, yes it would. In fact, uh, if you want to get a sense of what it would look like, there's an amazing image that was taken of Pluto from behind where they could see the sunlight passing through its atmosphere. This is the same sort of effect just for Pluto instead of Earth. Um, so Veronica Cure is asking, does the color change depend on where you are observing? Yes. Different people in different places see different light getting scattered and reflected back to them. And so at different times in different places, you will see slightly different colors. Um, yes, Hanny, the ISS does have an instrument called NICER that is, uh, has been observing fast radio bursts. Um, it observes a bunch of other stuff. I don't know the details. This is one of those things where Wikipedia is your friend. And uh, scientists put a lot of effort into trying to keep Wikipedia fairly updated. We have more control over it than we do over some of the web pages out there. So it's often the most up-to-date place for you to go look, which is kind of weird to say, but true. Thank you, Shishkin. Um, thank you for the view over. Um, OK. Um, I'm being added by Nightbot. Uh, B Sky is saying, uh, do we think that the shutdown will contribute to additional delay in getting the James Webb telescope in the sky? I don't even want to think about that. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. James Webb is kind of a dirty word around here. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I think one of our CosmoQuest staff just got here. We're going to try and work together today up in my attic. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, CosmoQuest was funded by NASA from 2012 up until midnight December 31st, a couple weeks ago. And um, we were told back in August that we might have funding cuts due to James Webb Space Telescope cost overruns and some changes to policies. And we didn't just get funding cuts, we got our funding cut. And this coincided with us finding an amazing new organization to go work for, um, the Planetary Science Institute, which has over 100 PhD researchers, was pulling us in. So just at the point where we were ready to really shine, we lost all of our funding. And while they never said in the cancellation letter why we were canceled, because they can't, everything we'd been told beforehand was, well, James Webb is going to cost more than we thought, and the money has to come from somewhere. So all those cost overruns, all those government delays, all those people who are getting their back salary, thank God, but aren't going to put in the hours of work and are going to have to make up that time somehow. These are all cost overruns in various ways, and it all slows science. It slows progress. Okay, looking for something more cheerful to answer. Um, Larry is saying, hear about the Russian Space Telescope? I did. I read about it in the summer, and then I promptly forgot everything. Um, so yes, Russia has a space telescope. I've forgotten everything about it. I am sorry. Um, do you, so Stegen is asking, do you know anything about the news from NASA about landing a drone on Titan? Um, we currently have nothing orbiting Saturn. We currently have no missions planned to go to Saturn. And NASA's currently shut down. Uh, so if you saw any recent news, it was probably wishful thinking and something someone was looking to pr propose. But it's a dream, not a reality right now, which kind of sucks. Um, Titan's actually kind of the perfect place to have a drone. It's a fabulously thick atmosphere. It would be easy to fly around. There's not a lot of gravity. Um, but we don't have anything currently funded to do that. Yeah, Eddie agrees. Let's not talk about JWST. You're allowed to like it. I'm allowed to be depressed by it. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. It is something that we really need to be able to advance our understanding of extrasolar planets that shine in the infrared and of galaxy formation in the earliest moments of the universe. We need the instrument. This is why we're not all shouting sunk cost fallacy every time they increase its budget. Um, but its cost is great in ways that we hadn't expected. So uh, Hanny is asking, is China bringing any of the plants and worms back to Earth? I, I don't know. I don't know. I need to find these things out. Um, there is a car in space, Hanny. There is a car in space. Um, it is actually on a path that will take it out past Mars in an orbit around the sun. And that's kind of cool. It's kind of useless, kind of pointless, but awesome. And sometimes you do things because they're awesome and cool and get people to dream. And let's face it, if Elon Musk had used that launch of his red roadster to uh well launch a bunch of science experiments for teenagers or something like that thanks for the follow it's vj um and then it had blown up there would have been a lot of broken-hearted kids a lot of science education dollars that blew up with the launch if you blew up a red roadster red tesla people would just make fun of him and if he launched and he succeeded people would just make fun of him. So instead of potentially causing sadness, he just guaranteed that he'd get press coverage and get made fun of. It's what you can do. So um, Fenring is asking, maybe the extremely large telescope will ease some pain. What's that scheduled to be completed? Um, I'm still sad that they no longer are building the overwhelmingly large telescope. That one had so much better of an acronym. Um, I don't know when it's scheduled to be completed. All of these things are, are many, many years out. So the real question is, will we get these 
tens of meter telescopes before we get JWST. Now the thing is, even when we have those tens of meter telescopes, the colors of light that they can see don't include the colors that James Webb is going to be observing in because those colors just don't go through our atmosphere. So this is where space telescopes are so important. Our atmosphere blocks key colors of light, which is good because we don't all die from the UV and the gamma ray and the X-ray light that's coming from the sun. Death is bad, usually. Um, but at the same time, it means we do have to launch telescopes into space to be able to see all these different things. Um, so, so it'll help. And it is a race to see which gets completed first. Uh, so Stegen is saying, wouldn't uh, bringing back biological matter from the moon cause a hazard, hazard radiation and mutations and such? Um, so we radiate stuff on Earth all the time. People undergoing radiation therapy for cancer don't develop superpowers as much as they may want to. So we have radiated and blasted and done all sorts of things to things on Earth in labs, and so far, all good. Uh, we've also previously launched tomato seeds into space and then distributed them to school kids all across the United States and asked them to grow the tomatoes. And you'd better believe some of those kids ate the tomatoes. This isn't the first time we've done something like this. It's Earth life that went to the moon in a sealed container. We're bringing it back. Um, I don't know if we're bringing it back. I have no idea if we're bringing it back. Um, but we've done this before. It hasn't been a hazard. So here's waiting to find out, well, just what happens. How long do they grow? How well do they grow? We know that on the International Space Station, things don't like to thrive. But if it turns out the moon is a better place, its gravity is less than Mars. And that starts to tell us that it may be easier to live and thrive on Mars than it is in low Earth atmosphere. And that's kind of cool. Um, so let's see what other questions do we have in the here. So X-ray specialist punk, I like your username. Uh, is saying, I heard something about the external iris for Hubble. I haven't heard anything about an external iris. Um, I do know that the uh, wide field camera three is currently not functioning correctly. And they haven't been able to send up um, whatever commands are necessary to switch over to backup systems or to fix the problem because of the government shutdown. So uh, one of the coolest and most interesting instruments, in my opinion, in terms of the high resolution imagery we get back is currently down for the count. We're all optimistic it'll come back, but with the government furlough, we don't have the people who would bring it back going to work. Now, science is still being done. The instruments are, the other instruments are all still working just fine. So scientists who are waiting for data from anything but the wide field camera three, they're okay. Uh, there's just a lot of people who are waiting for data from the wide field planet, wide field camera three that aren't getting their data. And data is actually with Hubble also tied to money. So there are people out there that were expecting funding to pay for computers, to pay for students who can't get that funding because the government is shut down and no one can fix Hubble. It's really kind of amazing just how far ranging the consequences of this government shutdown happen to be. It's our new normal, temporarily, we hope. Um, yeah. So Hanny is asking, do plants, planets slow down their rotation over time due to precession, or will they continue to spin eternally? So, so precession um, is basically the, the aspect of a spinning top where the point of the spin, the spin axis itself, is slowly rotating. That isn't going to slow down the rotation of a world. It's just going to change the orientation of the rotation. What we do have is interactions between different worlds that affect rotation rates. Here on the Earth, we have our own world getting slowly yanked on, torqued by the moon. 
and the irregularities on the world mean that when a mountain goes by and is perpendicular to the moon, it's getting a whole lot of torque trying to yank it back to be lined up with the moon. Um, and that torque is slowing the Earth's rotation. We used to have a day that was less than 20 hours. And as the Earth's rotation slows, the moon's orbit gets larger. It's all part of conservation of angular momentum and everything reacting together. Now, we aren't actually going to lose our moon, but we will eventually no longer have complete solar uh, eclipses. We're going to have just, well, the moon centered in front of the sun um, with an annulus around it of glowing sun. Uh, this still happens. This already happens occasionally if we have a lunar eclipse, not a lunar eclipse, if we have a solar eclipse when the moon is at its furthest point from the earth in its orbit, uh, we just end up with that annulus of light instead. Um, worlds that don't have moons that are far enough away from the sun that they are not really experiencing a lot of torque, and they'll spin forever. Worlds that have moons can get sped up or slowed down depending on the resonances of the different orbits. Um, it all comes down to what's the angular, what's the angular momentum and what are the forces within the system. Every outcome is possible. Uh, so, so Veronica is asking, uh, with the moon slowly moving away, will landing on the backside help to slow that down if done enough? I, I don't think the mass of a th few spacecraft is really going to have an effect over the millennia of time. The moon's moving away uh, at a rate we can actually measure. I want to say it's a couple centimeters a year. But we, we can't, with our little tiny rovers, really create a difference. It's like a toddler pushing on the pyramids of Giza. It's just not going to be able to move them. Uh, so Fenring is asking, if all the planets and moons were perfect spheres made of perfectly rigid material, would there be, would their rotation slow down? No. That's the awesome thing. If everything were perfect spheres, if there were no uh, distortions to cause that lever, to create that lever arm, to create that tor torque, everything would just stay orbiting and spinning the way it started. Um, it's the imperfections that cause the changes over time. Um, so, so, Hanny, um, I guess you're asking uh, if it's the reflectors that allow us to measure the different distance. Yes, uh, there are various facilities, including uh, the Lunar Laser Ranging Station down at McDonald Observatory in Texas, where they use mid-sized telescopes, 30-inch class telescopes, to capture reflected laser light. So what they do is they start by um, pulsing the laser light out of the telescope, where they essentially mount the laser where an eyepiece would go and uh, pulse the light out, flip to having a mirror to receive. And um, by counting how long it takes in terms of seconds, they, or fractions of a second, they can measure, thanks to the speed of light, the distance to the moon in millimeters. It's really kind of amazing and on a dusty night, it's also really beautiful to see this green light flashing off towards the moon or whatever it is they might be laser ranging on a given night. Um, <laughs> Veronica, I'm sure many toddlers have indeed tried pushing on the pyramids. Uh, although I think nowadays you're not supposed to touch, but that's the way it is. So that, uh, it looks like the questions are starting to slow down in the chat. And uh, I have programmers starting to arrive so that we can work on getting CosmoQuest.org back up and functioning so that you guys can help us do science. Once again, this show is brought to you by the Planetary Science Institute, working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are here because of you. 
thank you so much for everything that you do to support us, whether it's tweeting that we're live, sharing out our show with other streams, rating us, auto hosting us, all these things really matter. And thank you so much to the people who mod, the people who donate, the people who subscribe. All of you keep this show going. So thank you. Now, um, this week, we will continue to have uh, the daily space every day. Friday, we hopefully will have Annie stepping in, which means the show may be a little bit different than normal. Um, I am going to be on my way to Boston, uh, where, as I said, I will be attending the Aresia Science Fiction and Fantasy Convention. If you're in the New England area and you happen to feel like going into the city on a snowy weekend, come check it out. I will be on a variety of panels. I will be selling artwork at the Broad Universe booth, and I'd love to talk science. I get out, see the eclipse this weekend, and uh, stay tuned. You never know what might happen here on this channel. I will, after the credits run, go, go ahead and try and find another educational streamer to raid on over to. So stay tuned. Keep watching and keep learning. And wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, afternoon. And remember, go outside and look up. Thanks. I'll see you later. <laughs>